Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. We have an industry giant here today. Carl Palmer oh, is sitting giant. across from me. Mm. Great to see you. It's nice to see you, Mitch. We appreciate you taking time. You're doing yeah. a concert right here at Sweetwater tonight. Apparently so. That's what they tell me. Yeah. It's sometime this evening. Yeah. We've got the pavilion outside. We're ready. Yeah. It's going to be very, very cool. Yeah. So, well, it will be cool. Yeah, it, so well, it might be a little bit cool, but yeah. it's going to be cool. Yeah. <laughs> so you're doing the uh, ELP Legacy Tour. Yes. Um, yes, we are. Yes. yes. So what we've got here is roughly about an hour, 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. We're covering music from the history of ELP, really. We've just had a new box set released, right. which is very, very important, which really is the true story of ELP, not only in vinyl and CD form, but in book form, um, photographic form, some amazing stuff, some stuff that hasn't been released. As you know, Greg and Keith um, passed last year, sure. one in March, Keith in March and Greg in um, December. Mm -hmm. So the whole of this year I've basically been playing a tribute to them and that's what this still is and the music that I've chosen is really from the first album, second album and, and as wide a variety as what one could you know. Um, there's a historical piece in there called Pictures of an Exhibition which was originally by Mazorsky mm -hmm. and this was a piece of music that made radio history here in America way back in the early 70s. Scott Mooney from WMMR in New York played the whole piece in its entirety whilst we were in the back of a limousine being picked up from the airport. Nice. It was the days when the, the, um, the record uh, representative would jump out of the car, make a, a call from a phone box because we didn't have mobiles and tell the uh, radio station, start playing it now. Right. And they did. So it would be an interesting show. And I feature Paul Bielitovich on guitar, uh, Simon Fitzpatrick on uh, bass guitar, six string bass mm -hmm. and 10 string Chapman stick. So that'll be quite exciting. Right. And obviously I get featured and we, we play things, pictures at an exhibition. Uh, uh, we play music which is really spread out. I mean, Barbarian from the first album, um, pictures being that first live album, Welcome Back My Friends being the epic ELP piece. Um, there's some off the wall things like Peter Gunn, um, Hoedown from the right. Rodeo Suite, which is from the Tarkas album. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting, uh, interesting show. We're also, we've just added a, a version of Lucky Man oh, nice. as a tribute to Greg Lake. And I'll be coming out after the show and I'll be signing, you know, whatever merch people have got. And we've also got some of my artwork on display. And um, there's an interesting section in the artwork. I'm call, I call it My Legends. And I did a, a, a canvas for Keith, mm -hmm. who died in March, as I said last year. And I called it Welcome Back. And I did one for Greg, which I didn't want to be doing another one so soon, sure. but there you go. And I called that uh, Lucky Man. Right. Um, and then uh, January came this year and we lost John Wetton, who was the lead singer in Asia. So it's been right. quite a hectic series. But I did this My Legend series. So I've got these three here with me which for people to see, which are kind of, you know, they're historical, you know. And these people in my life are very important. Of course. You know, not only did I record some of the greatest music with them, I played some of the greatest concerts ever in my life. So um, quite a poignant moment in time that it relates to. Right. So we've got that to show as well after. And as I say, I'll come out and talk about that as well. So. All in all, I hope it's going to be a nice show. I'm really looking be forward to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it can be great. It's very interesting to, uh, I've, I've watched some videos of the, the band performing, the way you've reimagined it for guitar-based drums versus yes. keyboards-based mm. drums. Can you talk a little bit about the process you went through to do that? Yeah, well, the process was really quite difficult, really. I, I had the dilemma, do, do I duplicate or do I try and put this music into a new generation of ELP followers? I know that all the, the older people that follow the original ELP will probably be there to see what it was like you know, what's the intrinsic value here? What, 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 why is he doing this? But I figured I needed to make a new generation, make it their music, make it their own. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I needed to show how versatile ELP music was. And the music today is, is versatile to the degree of the musicianship. If the musicians are good enough, and my two guys are outstanding players, right, right. are really you know, unbelievable, um, then you can portray this music in another way. Mm -hmm. And then another generation makes it their own. Of course, they'll always revisit the original. Right. That's always going to be there. But there was no reason to copy. So that's why it's, it's based on, a, on an instrumental sort of prog rock metal sort of based sound, mm -hmm. where we play all the vocal lines with the Chapman stick. Um, which is a 10 string Chapman stick, not the 12. Uh, and that works remarkably well. So it's, it's, it's different. Right. It's not everyone's cup of tea, as we say in England. But to be honest with you, for me, um, ELP music has been played by ELP, by classical orchestras in Tokyo, by orchestras in Germany. Um, it's been done in quite a few ways. It's never been done like this. Right. And this could never have been done like this if the musicianship um, 
was it wasn't this good mm -hmm. and it is sensational I don't know if you know, but in England we have lots of uh, academies and music schools now that specialise just in guitars. We didn't have that years ago. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that if ELP had come across somebody like Paul Bielatovic when we were forming the band, we might have been a four-piece four band. Mm -hmm. We just couldn't find anyone who could play the stuff that we needed to be played. Right. I, they just weren't that good then. Um, guitar players, as you know, have come on a tremendous amount, where keyboard players have slowed down. The 70s, there were lots of great keyboard players, not so many great, great guitar players like today, right. but the role is reversed. So I've just used that to take it to that next generation. Mm -hmm. And that's really what the band's all about musically, or my vision of it. Right. So what was the process of finding the two musicians? Did you go through auditions, or how did that happen? No, it doesn't work like that anymore, to be honest, uh, honest with you. Going around the clubs looking for great bands or great musicians, I don't think that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. I think what you do is, because we have these academies and institutes and music schools, which I mentioned to you earlier, that specialize in in guitar and bass guitar, six stringed instruments. Sure. Um, it's better just to call them up and ask them who they've got. Hmm. Who is the who is the outstanding student? Who is the outstanding musician? Right. And you know, get a clip, get a soundbite, and have a listen to it. Mm -hmm. Interview the guy. That's a much better way to do it. That's how I did it with the, both of the guys that I've got. Mm -hmm. And um, you'd be surprised. You know, they they come back and they will say to you like the guitar um, school in Acton. Um, said we have two people, and um, one of them is uh, we had to we had to change the actual standard for technique from 95 to 97 because this guy was so good. Hmm. Oh, I said, what do you mean as far as you reporting and recording and marking it in your re in, uh, in your grading? Yes. Oh, but there's another guy, and the guy that they talked about was Simon Fitzpatrick, and the second guy that they talked about is actually somebody that shares an apartment or actually shares part of. Simon's apartment with him. So okay. the two bass players live together. Right. Um, but I, I chose Simon, yeah. Um, right. Not knowing that he was the one that was slightly, or meant to be slightly better. Mm -hmm. I think they were both as good, you know, the different qualities. Um, he came round to my house and that was it. And he was from, uh, he was from a shire called Hertfordshire. And I live in a, an area called Hertfordshire, and he was uh, from just down the road from me, from Rickmansworth. Right. He no longer lives there, but I said, oh, you're in then, you've got to be in. <laughs> you're that was it. Um, and with them, um, with Paul, the lead guitar player, that actually came through a recommendation from the guy that had just left me. I had a chap called Sean, uh, Sean Baxter, who became uh, the head of the guitar department at the school in Acton, in the centre of London. And when he decided to leave, because he had a bad tinnitus problem, which had developed in both ears, we had a car crash and the seatbelt went into his neck and tinnitus started. We think it might have triggered it and then the other ear triggered. We're not absolutely sure, but it was directly after that these problems started to come through. So Sean, um, who was an incredible player, said to me, there is a young guy coming up who's not actually in my um, school, but is in the academy in Surrey. And uh, he said, I'll get some information on him for you, but we keep hearing about him. So I said, fine, mm -hmm. send it up. And, uh, and Paul sent me um, uh, what I consider to be now a bad version of Flight of the Bumblebee. Well, the fact he sent something up that wasn't blues and wasn't, you know, that general sort of thing all the guitar players play, and it was a classical piece, right. I was attracted immediately because that's the essence of the music anyway. It's European based. Sure. And uh, though it was funny and uh, we wouldn't want to play it like that, <laughs> uh, I thought, yeah, he's got to be on the right track. And he was. And uh, he's been with me 12 years. Right. Nice. Might have nice. been even a bit longer. Right. Yeah. So did you have all of the parts uh, scored out? So did they read the parts or were they learning them by no, ear? No, what or? happened was I had to find out what could be played on guitar. I wasn't completely sure. And there was a specialist who did, uh, who, who specialized in transposing from guitar part, from keyboard parts to guitar. And um, I sat with him for a couple of weeks on and off. And we talked about all this music. He actually couldn't play the stuff, but he knew how to transpose and make it work, possible to play on, on the neck. You know? okay. And um, it, I was told well, this could be played, that could be played. And when I would request, but this is more important as a line. Okay, but you can't have this. Okay, we'll put that on the other instrument and we'll break it up that way. So we broke it up. I had about, ooh, maybe about 10, 12, 15 charts done mm -hmm. uh, for lead guitar. And that was the beginning of it. And uh, I still have those. And that's, that's how we, we, we started off. Right. And there's always a compromise, you know, because if you have a, a keyboard instrument, obviously you're going to get a lot more harmony structure involved. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have guitar, you've got single notes and chords, and, you know, you can't have it quite as much as a keyboard. When you have a bass, six string bass guitar, and you can start to involve chords as well, right. and a Chapman stick, then you start to cover a bit more of that harmony land, as I call it. Mm -hmm. And 
So it's still a case of sorting out what makes the music work for those instruments and what really uh, portrays the music in a new way. So that's what would, that was the next level, is finding out how to make it sound good. Okay, that can be played, but does it sound good? Right. You know? right. So it was quite a long procedure, but then I realized it would work. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sean Baxter, who was a beautiful choice to have at the very beginning, because he came in and said, Carl, that's we can play that, but at the same time, I could tap this out as well. And, the, and you know, and Dave on bass, a guy called Dave, he could do that. That would definitely work. And they'd play it for me. And then I'd say, no, but I'm still missing. That's the line I need. I know that's it. OK, and you need to copy the solo exact. Mm -hmm. Certain solos are in concrete. They have to be there. They're like right. melodies, you right. know. They're like middle eights. They have to be. And um, that's how it started, really. So when Paul jumped on board, he had a great blueprint to follow um, because we'd already made a recording, works, um, a Working Live Volume 1. And um, there was a second one in the works as well, so he, he could listen to that. So it was a case of developing. And it's got to a stage now where I tell them that I want to look at this piece of music and they know exactly where to go. They know the, the train of thought. They know the musical track they've got to go down. Right. And they'll bring it in and um, I will get it in rehearsals. And then I, I basically want all the parts learnt and then I'll throw out what I don't need. Mm -hmm. That way I think that they understand the music a lot better. Um, I get total choice and then I can piece it together as I want it. And I think it's very good for them to understand the innards of it, right. you know, what all the harmony structures are and things. Right. So um, that's how it came about, really. Right, right. I think it's probably the only trio in the world that does what we do, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, because it is, um, it is unusual. It is extremely definitely. unusual. As I say, it might not be to everyone's liking, but it definitely takes the music to a new generation and to a guitar generation. And let's face it, in, in the world of rock and roll that we're all in, the guitar is still God, you know, sure. is the instrument, <laughs> right, you know. Right, right. So shifting the focus to your parts, one of the things that always stands out to me listening to your playing is how you treat the drums as a melodic instrument. Yeah, I've never been, um, I've never been a drummer that's wanted to keep time, mm -hmm. mainly because I don't enjoy doing it, to be honest with you, um, because it's rather boring. Um, so with ELP, I try to fill out the group and make it sound as big as I possibly can. Um, by playing unison lines with Keith, which I still do. Mm -hmm. And obviously when there comes a time when I've just got to lay down an offbeat, yes, I'll do that. You know, I'm, I'm not opposed to doing it, but you know, there's a lot more that can be achieved as well as. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my, um, my approach to um, the drum parts as far as it's concerned with the group now is pretty much the same as what it was with ELP. Pretty much the same. Obviously, I've changed a few things around um, to make it a bit sort of heavier sounding because it is quite heavy and quite rocky. Right. Though ELP sounded big, um, this is a different kind of rawness, which is actually quite magical and I like to capture. Mm -hmm. Though it might not be as full, there's a certain rawness and energy which is new and exciting. And of course, that will kind of persuade the drum parts to change as well, which they do. So right. that, that happens. Um, so my approach has been pretty much the same. And um, when we get into rehearsals, you know, I, I'm always looking to try and improve the parts as we go along. I mean, why not? You know, sure. they're there to improve. So. Yeah, it's been, it's exciting. I mean, I still enjoy playing the music because the catalogue is so vast. Right. You know, we'll be playing it forever. Yeah. You know, and that's probably yeah. the way it should be, you know. Mm -hmm. I've got an album coming out now on BMG, which will be a, a worldwide release. Um, they're the same people that brought the ELP box set out. Mm -hmm. um, they're bringing out an album called Carl Palmer Live in the USA. And there are some new, newer classical pieces on there that ELP didn't play. Um, I'll leave it as a surprise right now. So I'm still going down the same route because basically for me that classical adaptation, turn it, turning music into a contemporary sort of format using modern day instruments was always top of my list. Right. So that's all it is now really. Right. Uh, and I just wanted it to sound rockier mm -hmm. uh, and which, you know, um, which we have done. <laughs> sure, definitely. Uh, and there is no vote. There are no vocals. We've had uh, we've had vocalists come in. Uh, Todd Rungren um, right. came in and sang with the band the other day, and that was really great. Did Lucky Man, and that's something that we might do in the future. I might play a little more of the softer stuff uh, and have vocalists come in and still sing. Still, you turn me on from the beginning. You know, footprints in the snow. Um, you know that kind of stuff. Right. Um, 
that might sort of happen. And I just think it's nice to just keep that sort of going as a separate thing, you know, because mm -hmm. um, I, I really want it to be, um, I want it to be uh, a band that you can't really, you can't put it into a jazz club and you can't just put it into a rock club. It does stand on its own. What is this? Right. You know, right. and, and I like that. I like niche. Right. And I think that's what it's all about. Right, right. So contrast your approach to drumming with ELP versus what uh, you did with Asia, yes. then, which was a, a different type of an yes, environment. Yes. Asia was basically four on the floor mm -hmm. to some great songs. And when the songs are that good, you know, even I will do that, you know. Um, <laughs> anything that makes me cry and that's emotionally sound, um, then, you know, when the minute I heard things like Only Time Will Tell and Heat of the Moment, there was no doubt, you know, OK, I've got that. Um, you know, I can play an offbeat as good as anyone. I'll do that, you know. Right. When it's on that level, then, you know, I'm up for it. You mm -hmm. know, there's no doubt about that. And things like Soul Survivor, which have got that harder edge to it, really worked for me. Wildest Dreams really worked for me. So that first album was a combination of having commercial plays, but still a certain amount of musical integrity. Right. And that's right. what we achieved. That was one of the really attractive things with that band it, was the fact that there was, was that musicianship along yeah. with that. And it worked. It worked really well. David Geffen was a great help, and uh, that worked remarkably well. And the timing was right. Mm -hmm. That social media thing had started. MTV, VH1, you know, and David Geffen just you know, jumped on the back of it. The second album was good. We only really had problems by the time we hit the third album uh, and John was really too ill to go on you know because he you know he suffered from uh, alcoholism so yeah. um, which he managed to actually put completely behind him the last 13 years of his life is completely controlled that's why Asia reformed in 2006 so you know um, he was a marvelous man marvelous mm -hmm. man can't say enough about him right right I'll ask you the same question I asked Jeff Downs when he was here earlier this year what was it in the water in the UK in those early 70s, late 60s, that led to so much of an uprising of great prog rock coming out of the, the area. To tell you the truth, the English people have been sort of, or the Europeans in general, have had so much sort of like um, avant-garde sort of jazz, like um, European avant-garde jazz from mm -hmm. Switzerland and odd places like this and Italy. And, Oh, and just a cornucopia of classical music coming at you from every direction, every day, you know, every minute of the day that there is definitely a combination of this kind of let's experiment, um, like Sgt. Pepper probably being the first real pro rock album, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's just in, it's just in the genes, to tell you the truth. You know, we're not blues based, mm -hmm. you know, um, like you are here. Right. We're not, that's, we can play it, but that's not there, you know. Um, it's not the way we would go. Um, it's like, how can I put it to you? Once I auditioned Steve Howe, who's a great friend, he came along to audition for Atomic Rooster. Mm -hmm. And um, Vincent Crane said to me, um, let's get um, Steve to, Howe to play a blues. Now, Steve could play blues all day long. But I remember at rehearsals, he said, oh, I don't really want to do that. Can I not just learn a piece of music? And we wanted to hear how well he played, you know. Right. So we would only revert to the blues just to hear somebody have a blow, you know. It's mm -hmm. not, we don't want to do that. You know, right. uh, and he was a prime example of the way an English person thinks, no, I'd rather just learn some new music or learn a, some pieces. Don't mm -hmm. really want to play the blues. As I say, not because he couldn't. He could play, probably play the blues as good as anyone. You know? right. Right. So that's really what it's all about. And I think in England, we just have that, um, we're conservative, you know, and we don't expect people to clap. One of the reasons why we come to America is because you do clap right. in the middle of a piece of music, <laughs> right. which is basically unheard of over there. So right. um, there's a lot of gratification here. And I think whilst you gave the world modern jazz or jazz, we gave the world prog rock. Mm -hmm. yeah. As much as you might not like it, we gave it to you. <laughs> You've got to take that. And of course, I'm very, um, I'm very grateful to be at the beginning of a movement that was very fresh. Right. And I was in with probably one of the bands that laid down a huge blueprint. Um, I got a, a war, an award the other day, which I never really even thought about getting, you know, it wasn't on my agenda. I never woke up in the morning and said, I need to be a prog god, you know, but they gave it to me. But, you know, I took it um, uh, bearing in mind that um, it belonged to Greg and Keith as well. You know? Sure, sure, right, right, right. It's, it's interesting how your background led up to that because your ancestors were musicians, right? A great yes. grandfather that played yeah. drums and his mother played classical guitar. The great great grandmother, yeah. 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 Um, basically, the, the family are basically classically based. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm not saying they were great, but they were all working musicians and made a living at it. And that was their objective, really, you know, it wasn't to be famous or 
playing the you know on the radio or whatever at the time that was the big deal it was just to make a living at it and some of them did remarkably well my grandfather conducted at the royal uh, the london palladium which is one of our main theaters which gets appears on television every sunday it's a bit like the ed sullivan show used to be that london palladium had their own show mm -hmm. and he conducted there during the war his brother also was a drummer and he was um, he had a great orchestra out on canvey island the, their mother my great great grandmother was one of the first class classical guitar players yeah, in England. Mm -hmm. um, my father played, uh, my real father was a piano player, my stepfather was a drummer, song and dance man, played rhythm guitar. Uh, my eldest brother was a guitar player mm -hmm. um, and we played in a, a kind of a band like Lawrence Welk together. Um, it was about 15 of us with a girl, so you know what Lawrence Welk is. So sure, right. well, I did that for about two years, which was dreadful. Um, but um, <laughs> it I learned how to read, you know. Right. Um, I wish I hadn't had to tell you the truth, but it was good training. And then my younger brother, who's about five years younger than me, is also a professional drummer and has been for, I don't know how many years, years upon years, and teacher. <laughs> he teaches uh, in my hometown, Birmingham, at about four schools, and he plays about four residences a week, or three <laughs> residences, I'm not sure. And um, my nephew, um, my eldest brother's son, he's a pilot for Virgin, but was a professional drummer for many years and still plays today. Mm -hmm. So uh, nice. it's there. There's too many drummers, yeah. Right, but right. Every cupboard you open, a drum will roll out, you know. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, string players and drummers is what we've got. Right, yeah. right. But you actually started on banjo, didn't you? I did, yes, because my, my father, who was a song and dance man, the MC, he, um, he was a retailer. We mm -hmm. had about three shops. Two of them we owned, and the sec third shop was owned in partnerships. And we had a couple of market stalls, which he used to like to run. He never liked to be in the shop. Anyway, he used to play a little bit of banjo badly and a little bit of guitar better. And anyway, I used to just pick up his banjo and I looked at the chord book and, you know, there was those with the strings with the dots and that. Okay, and, and that started. And then I came across a piece of music by uh, George Formby called When I'm Cleaning Windows. Anyway, I learned it. And that, uh, the problem was they didn't like me playing it because I thought it was too comedic as an instrument. So I could only play it when they were not in the house. Right. So that was seven. And I learned to play that pretty good, actually. Right. Not great, you know, but good enough. Oh, sure. And I've still got two today. I've got two yeah. uh, ukuleles, they are. But mm -hmm. we call them banjoleles because they're actually a small banjo with, with a vellum, with a head, right. not the guitar shape, you know. Uh -huh. So we call them ukuleles. Um, you call them ukuleles, we call them banjo -lales, this particular model. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, um, uh, the, the prime thing was, well, as I got older, was I thought, well, you know, well, when I'm away from home, I'll buy myself one, you know, another one. And I managed to get a Wendell Hall um, uh, banjo lele, which is made here in America mm -hmm. uh, by the Ludwig Company. When Ludwig weren't making enough money at making drums, they made uh, uh, banjo -lales. And anyway, I've got one of those, which is a collector's piece now. Nice. Plus, I've got the George Formby uh, B series, which is the cheap one, which right. I actually like the sound of better. <laughs> it's right. not quite as bright, doesn't hurt my ears. Right. Um, so from that, I moved on to uh, violin when I was 11 because of the grandfather being uh, teaching um, theory, um, cello, violin, I think, and piano accordion, funnily enough, at the Royal Academy. So I tried the violin for a couple of months. It just didn't work. Mm -hmm. And um, not for me. I did it because they said, try it. It's here. And the piano wasn't there. For, had, we had a piano, but that didn't work. And then I saw a drum set, really. And it was a color that I was attracted to. It was red glitter. I said, would you get me one of those? So they bought me a snare drum. And that's how it started. And had a snare drum for a little while with one of these little see-through flexi discs that you put on. And you listen to the guy playing. And I could play that. You got that. Yeah, next. Got that. Got that. And they realized, hey, there's something there. And then the following Christmas, they bought me a drum set. Nice. which I didn't know about and they put it upstairs in the front bedroom and my mother asked me to go into the room and um, sort something out. She said, could you go into the top room there and pick up um, this, which she never ever asked me to do. And as I walked in there, it was set up and I just cried. I said, I'm in, right. I'm in, and that right. was it, you know. Right. Uh, that followed uh, with the Gene Krupa story, which was called Drum Crazy in, in Europe. The Gene Krupa story here, my father took me to see that and that was a light bulb moment and walked down the road ever since. Right, right. So at 15, you were already recording with, with yes. the Craig, right? Yeah, I recorded at Regent Sound in Denmark Street in London, where a lot of the Mersey uh, groups recorded when they came to London. Mm -hmm. like Jerry and the Pacemakers and, you know, lots of bands, you know, the Fortunes and um, the Kinks recorded there. It was one of the studios you all went to. And uh, I recorded there, yeah, um, for Fontana. Uh -huh. uh, Larry Page was the, um, the chap that organised that. So that was... Um, 
Yeah, I was a f actually I was just fifteen, just mm -hmm. fifteen. Yeah. Right, right. Then it had to be such a whirlwind. The the crazy world of Arthur Brown, Atomic Rooster, ELP. All of that happened in a pretty short span of time, didn't yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, they say that you know you need a certain amount of luck, but you need a certain amount of savvy as well. You know, um, one of the reasons that I did those sessions for Arthur Brown, I'd never been a session drummer. And I was, I was, you know, against being employed mm -hmm. by anybody, because <laughs> um, our, our sort of idea was that if you're going to go into music, then you know, because then my family's attitude had changed. They all worked for a wage because that was the best thing. But when they realised what the music industry had become, they said you have to work for yourself, obviously. Mm -hmm. And that's even what my grandfather was, you know, saying, as well as my father. You have to work for yourself. You have to roll the musical dice and take a chance. Mm -hmm. You can always get a job because you can read. You can always join the Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, which they wanted um, me to be in, because you know, it was index linked with the pension and all that stuff. It's not anymore, but it was then, you know. Right. Uh, that's what they wanted so um, I, I never did sessions but this one particular phone call that came through I was so enamored by this guy because I'd heard about this psychedelic or psychedelia movement as you call it here mm -hmm. and I'd gone along to one of the clubs called UFO in the Tottenham Court Road and I was just amazed I was 17 I thought there's a lot of lights a lot of colors there's obviously a lot of drugs going on here you know I mean I was with Chris Farlow and the Thunderbirds at that stage mm -hmm. and um, I got a call um, from their management saying, would you come along and do some recordings? Now, I wasn't the only drummer. There was a guy called John Eisman. There was a chap called uh, John Marshall from Soft Machine. And there was the original drummer, Jason Th uh, Dr Dracian Theken. Theker. Dracian Theker. Um, anyway, I got a call and I went along and played. And uh, I did Fire and I did a couple of other pieces. And uh, that was it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've only just learned today that even Arthur had never found out who, who was on the recordings. Because... Um, um, Kit Lambert, um, who, who did all the recordings, never marked on the boxes who was who. Hmm. Anyway, I ended up joining the group and coming right. here to America when I was 18. And they gave me a percentage and they were very nice. And Arthur was, um, was a fantastic person. I just met him the other day at the, at the Prog, Rock, uh, <laughs> Prog Rock Awards. Um, and he told me that our um, fire is 50 years old next year. Wow. So I'll get together with him and play that. I, I'd like to play it with my band on stage, actually, because I like some samples, you know. I am the, I am, I am, I am the god of hell. I am, I am. I. <laughs> so we're going to do a bit of that for next year. Right. That, that's definitely in the works. Oh, that'll be great. Yeah, yeah. That'll be great. That'll be great. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in uh, how you've taken both the musical art and combined it with other art forms that you work in. Yeah. For example, the creative dance interpretations of, of some of the uh, ELP things, and also your your uh, work on canvas, rhythm on canvas. Well, so the rhythm on canvas and the twist of the wrist, um, the rhythm of light, twist of the wrist being the first catalog, started in 73. I had this idea to tape um, um, light bulbs to drumsticks with a cable going down to a battery on the floor and mime playing the drums. Obviously, you couldn't play mm -hmm. because you'd break the light bulbs. So I mimed, and the local photographer in my hometown took some photographs. Um, and one of these photographs is actually in my art book, um, which I released. And it made the local paper, you know. I was really like, wow, this was an award-winning photograph topic. Right. And uh, I realised there was some, something to do with the movement of light and rhythm. I really got the idea from Arthur Brown. I used to play with four strobe lights around me. And I used to notice, and I'm sure you've all seen it, when a light, something moves through a strobe, you get this thing, and you get these patterns, and you think, oh, God, what's that? In the... And, you know, that's why I've got these bags. I've got no muscles left in my eyes now, you know. Um, the peripheral vision's really bad. Um, so I realised there was something then. It wasn't until 73 I thought, well, I'm going to experiment myself. I did. Um, if you roll forward 40 years from there, they started developing drumsticks with LED lights at the tip of the stick, uh, which were basically indestructible before they used to break. And this new version was really, like, perfect. Mm -hmm. You get the four colours, red, yellow, green, blue. And so I started playing with these sticks, and the results were amazing. Um, there was a company uh, in Los Angeles that called me up and said, um, Carl, would you like to jump on board and do this? And I immediately said, no, I've got the T-shirt, done it. And they laughed and they didn't think it was true. A lot of people didn't think that I'd been there before. And then I finally found this photograph and everyone realised that I started it, you know. Right. Um, but now technology had caught up because we needed digital cameras, offset shutter speeds, possibly with slow flashes on one of the cameras. We needed a computer. We needed to feed it into a computer. We needed to look at the colour channels. And the art form was born, mm -hmm. basically. And obviously they've gone on to do guitar players and other drummers, but 
Yeah, it's a, it's a true art form that really belongs to our generation because without the advancements that we've had in technology, this wouldn't have existed really. Right. The ideas, are, you know, you can always come up with, well, you can't always, but you, you can always foresee an idea, something that will happen. Um, it's just taking it to uh, fruition is difficult. How yeah. do you do that? And um, we managed to do it. And what I've done is I've done two catalogues now and I donate X amount of money to uh, charity each time. Most of the charities are listed in the back of the book. Most of the people who have bought are in the book. They don't have to be, but they're in the book. Um, so it's kind of like a family, you know, and I've got some people who have been following me for years and got maybe, you know, four or five, six or seven pieces from each catalogue. Or maybe they've got as many as 18 pieces. I mean, it's been quite, uh, quite interesting. Right. And as I say, the most important ones I have at the moment and which will be on display today, and maybe even Sweetwater might want some of them. They're, uh, um, it's called My Legend series, and it's one to Keith Emerson and um, Greg Lake and John Wetton, who are three of the notoriously famous prog rock stars from England. Right, right. Speaking of technology and uh, your art, you probably did the first electronic drum solo with Takata. We did, yes. The technology used in those days was a little bit different than what people are using today. Yes, I mean, that was built for me by a guy called Nick Rose. Bob Moog, bless him, did try, and he did get it going, but it wasn't enough. And I decided to use a mitigator that they use for guitar, uh, so I could actually change one sound and take it up, up an octave or down an octave. Mm -hmm. So if I had one sound, uh, you know, I could then have three sounds there, really. So I've had eight sounds altogether, three, three, oh, okay. Now we've got some sounds. Basically, the uh, mitigator took it up an octave mm -hmm. normally. So uh, I would have eight sounds, 16 sounds now really is what it was. And that took some time to develop. They're extremely uh, limited. They were set. You couldn't change them. They were there. And um, we decided to use it in the middle of Takata um, by Ginastera. And uh, it came out. It was on the Brain Salad Surgery album. Right. It came out, and a lot of people thought it was uh, was Keith Emerson and stuff. So it was too it was too far in front of its time to explain to everybody, mm -hmm. you know, what we had done or what I had done. We just left it and said, you know, uh, electronic drum. They didn't get it, so just, just, <laughs> right. we just left it. Yeah. So right. as time went by, we kind of filtered it out, you know. Right. Um, right. And I suppose that's the. Um, that's the way the English people are, really. They're right. a bit sort of like laid back and stuff like that. Sure. You don't really sort of boast about it, but it was the first, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, that was amazing. Amazing uh, leap forward, really. Yeah, it was, yeah. And the technology concept. followed again, you mm. know. Um, I, I just said to one particular guy, ELP had its own boffin, its own electrician full time. And I just explained to Nick, this should happen. So what we actually had was, we had two mics on each drum. One mic was for the PA and one mic was to trigger the small synthesizers, which were the size of a cigar box. Mm -hmm. when I wanted to use them. There was an on and off switch by the mitigator. So that's how it was. So you'd always see one mic inside and one mic over the top. And people were always confused what was that all about. But that was because that's where I trigger my electronic sounds from. Right. I never actually use them within the music to enhance the music. I only use them in that solo section. Okay. It wasn't until later on when the technology had been you know, developed way down the line, I started using more electronic drums and things um, in... Uh, um, Black Moon and in the hot seat. Sure, sure, right, right, right. Fascinating stuff. So when I have an artist on your level here, I always like to ask the same question. Yes. You've worked with so many great artists during your career, we could list the whole uh, yes. incredible list. Yes. What is it that makes a great artist? I think, you know, you have to see a lot of great artists to see what is a great artist. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of great artists, but there are some people that just stand out, you mm -hmm. know. And um, if uh, you've ever been fortunate to see somebody like Elvis Presley, you'll see a great artist. Mm -hmm. You'll see somebody who's just on a level of being able to sing a ballad and make you cry and then just rip you to pieces with a rock song, you know, right. and, and just look like a god, you know. Um, and when you see somebody like uh, Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay as a boxer, um, I like boxing, I've seen many boxers, but when you went to see him, he was a true gladiator. He looked like a male model. You did not think that was a boxer. Mm -hmm. And there are some artists that just stand out on that level. And it's hard to say what it is because there are great artists and there are great, great artists. Right, right, right. Interesting. Yeah. Carl, thanks so much for taking time. Thank we you. know you have your uh, sound check coming up and the we big do. show tonight, and we're just uh, so glad that you uh, no, no, I'm pleased to be here. This year. Really a well, pleasure. Well, that didn't hurt, Mitch. I've got to tell you. Well, I'm, I'm oh, glad it wasn't oh, too painful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Mitch Gallagher.